that the concept was with, I immediately thought of the passage that I wanted to do, and it was John 4. So, um, John 4, I just titled this talk, Making a Scene, John 4 Viewed Through the Lens of Improv. Now, the reason why I wanted to do um, this particular uh, passage, Jesus and the Samaritan Woman at the Well, is because to me, this is such a great example of Jesus being with, okay? And, and I see it through the dual lens of spiritual direction as a spiritual director. How many of you, I'm gonna peek real fast, how many of you are involved in spiritual direction here on campus? Oh, come on guys, it's free to you. <laughs> I highly recommend that you take advantage of it while you're here on campus. Uh, the Institute for Spiritual Formation does an incredible job training spiritual directors. So let me explain to you real fast what spiritual direction is if you're not familiar with it. It is a ministry in which one believer um, attends to another's soul by sitting with them and listening to them and inviting them to consider what their relationship with God is like. Now, if you know anything about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, I'm looking for slides that I don't, there they are, okay? Um, the Samaritan woman at the well, that's what that conversation is. So when I see this conversation, I see it through the lens of the spiritual director. To me, it is a brilliant spiritual direction conversation. But it is also, to me, through the lens of an improviser, a wonderful opportunity to show you what improvisation is all about. Now I wanna see hands. How many of you know what improvisation is? Yeah, okay, all right, these are my people. Um, improvisation, if you're not sure what we're talking about here, I, I trained in theatrical improvisation. So this is like the show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Right, yeah? And some of your favorite comedians are trained in improvisation, like anybody from SNL, Tina Fey, Stephen Colbert, Amy Poehler, Lin-Manuel Miranda, or any heard of the, these names? Okay, they're all trained, and any, anybody with Mark Evan Jackson? Any Good Place fans here? Okay. <laughs> um, people who are trained in improv are trained, uh, you think, to be funny. Right, I just named a lot of comedians. But that isn't exactly what improv does. Improv is not about being funny. Um, the end result can be to be funny, but the basic essential part of improv is how to uh, play well with others, how to create something together. And it involves listening and paying attention. So when I see Jesus sitting at the well with this Samaritan woman, I see Jesus being an incredible improviser. Okay, so let me give you a quick um, synopsis of the story. Um, Jesus uh, is, is leaving Jerusalem and he's heading to Galilee. And there's two ways that he can go. He can go the long way, which is the way that most Jews went at the time. Or you can go the short way, which is to go through Samaria. Now, why wouldn't Jews go through Samaria? I mean, we've all heard of the Good Samaritan, but I don't know if everybody's totally clear on why Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. And it's because of this. They were so pick and similar, but so just different, okay? The Samaritans, and they're still Samaritans today, they believe in the Torah, right? They believe in the Torah, but that's it. They didn't believe in the prophets or the Psalms. That isn't their story. They pay attention to the Torah. And here's another major difference between Jews and Samaritans. Jews believe, and it's their 10th commandment, that they should be worshiping God on Mount Gerizim, not Jerusalem. And Mount Gerizim is where S Samaria was at the time, right? See how different they are? <laughs> but it's the little differences that make the rub, right? So like if you think of uh, groups that don't get along, it would be like um, what was happening between the Protestants and the Catholics in Northern Ireland, or between Serbs and Croats, between uh, Biola and APU, right? <laughs> it's that kind of thing where, where there's so much similarity, but, but it's just the little differences that make, it, make, it, make the rub, okay? But because of this, the two groups despised each other. They were rivals in this way. They and the Samaritans were the lesser people, right? And you're talking about the Jews in this era are actually under Roman oppression as well, right? So they're both downtrodden, but we're gonna look down on these Samaritans. Getting the feel of 
who, this, who these people are? And Jesus says, no, I'm gonna go straight through Samaria. It's like he's got an appointment. And he goes and they've been walking a long way and he ends up in this town near Jacob's well at, named Sychar and he sends off his disciples to go get food and he plops himself down next to the well in the middle of the day. And here comes a woman to get water in the middle of the day. And it's been speculated that, that you know, she's all by herself, which isn't quite common for women to do uh, at this time. You're supposed to all go to the well together in the morning, but she goes in the middle of the day. So just clearly she's not, she's a little bit not with her community. And Jesus is waiting for her. And here's, here's the story. He has a conversation with her, and by the end of the conversation, she believes that he's the Messiah. She goes back into her town and she tells everybody that she's met the Messiah, and she evangelizes her whole town. One conversation. So what's going on in this conversation? I suppose this, you might say that the things that Jesus says in this conversation are amazing, right? If you recall the, the conversation that he has with her, if you're familiar with this passage, this is where we get, you know, we'll worship, true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. He talks about living water. There's all these amazing things he talks about. And you could say the things that Jesus says is what convinced her, but I, looking through an improviser's and a spiritual director's eyes say, what if how Jesus talked to the woman mattered just as much as what he said to her? What difference might that make? Well, if so, then what could we learn from Jesus about how to be with other people, especially those that are different from us, those that we're on the other side of? And in this day and age, don't you think that's something we need to consider, right? I mean, look how together this country is, how, how in unity we all are all the time. No, we're starting to split apart right now. Every, anywhere you go, you can talk to somebody who's on the other side of the divide from you. So let's look at what Jesus is doing as I see it through the eyes of an improviser specifically, okay? First thing that he does is he uh, creates safety. This is the first move in improv. Before you do improv, because improv is actually a very scary thing to do, you're stepping into the unknown, the first thing you have to do is create safety for yourself and the other people that you're gonna improvise with. So in, in, in improv language, what you do to create safety is you, um, you encourage one another, you take care of the other person. There's all kinds of games you play to, to, to create a sense that like, I'm okay. Because the posture of improvisation is not defensive. Like, check your own posture right now. Are you feeling defensive? Relax a little bit. The posture of, of play and of improv is a safety posture, which is a relaxed posture. So Jesus created safety for himself, I would argue, by following the will of the Father. That's the safest place Jesus knew how to be, was in the will of the Father. And he went through Samaria because he knew God was sending him there. In fact, after he has the conversation with the woman and she goes off into the city, the disciples come back with food and they're like, here, Jesus, eat. And he's like, I got food you guys don't even know about. And it's the will of the Father. Like it's that safe to him, it's that delicious to him. So Jesus is safe by following the will of the Father, but how does he create safety for the woman he's gonna talk to? Well, I would argue he meets her where she is in her safe place. She went to the well in the middle of the day because for her that felt safe. And think about it. This is gonna be a man and a woman in that culture that enough wasn't a safe conversation, right? And a Jew and a Samaritan. And he finds an open place that's in public but that's also private. So Jesus starts by saying, let's make this a safe place for us to have a conversation, okay? And so you'll notice that in John 4, 3 through 8, right? So the woman comes to, of Samaria comes to draw the water. See the bottom there? For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. This is another way he made it safe. He sent off his disciples. Because those guys, you know, they knew all the right things to say, right? They always had the right answer. They never made anybody feel bad. <laughs> they, they told parents not to bring their children to Jesus. These guys didn't know what to do. <laughs> they were not great at making other people feel safe. So Jesus is like, you guys take off, I'm fine. 
and he makes her feel safe. Now, once everybody feels safe and we're ready to play, play begins when somebody makes an offer. Now, what's an offer? An offer is simply something that is presented to another person, okay? An offer is um, um, something that somebody gives you. This is just the first move. It doesn't mean you have to take it, but the thing has to be offered to you. And there are strong offers and there are, are weaker offers. And in improv, we're taught to make very strong offers. So for example, a strong offer in improv would be something like, um, um, Avast matey, go get the mainsail. Why is that a strong offer? Yeah, there's a character, right? You kind of know where I am, you know, you know the setting, right? And I'm telling you something. That's a strong offer. Uh, a weak offer would be like this. Hey. <laughs> That's a very weak offer. You don't have enough information there. So a person can't, is not going to feel safe to make a choice whether to accept the offer unless there is a strong offer. So here we go. So Jesus makes an offer to the woman. Give me a drink. That's a really strong offer. I'm going to tell you why that's a strong offer. Um, I'm going to show you what weaker offers under this. Give me a drink to the woman who's sitting there, right? He know she knows that what he wants and who he's talking to. A weaker offer would be, hey, would you mind giving me a drink? Weaker still, boy, am I thirsty. Right? And the weakest of all, hey. Okay? So he makes her an offer. Give me a drink. So he's setting up, this is, this is literally, you want to play? Want to have a conversation? So make a strong offer. If you're going to have a conversation with a person who's across the divide, make a strong, specific offer to them. Okay? Then what happens next? The person who is the person who's got the offer coming toward them, they get to choose whether to accept or block that offer. Okay? Accepting an offer is saying yes. You'll hear a lot of improvisers say yes all the time. They're very positive people. Because to say yes means I'm going to move the story forward. It means I'm going to agree to play with you. Okay? Blocking, on the other hand, is ignoring the reality that's been presented to you. So if she had ignored Jesus, no conversation. Right? If she had rejected it, if she just said no, and it's okay to say no, we're not supposed to accept all offers, but the ones that we are supposed to accept, saying no to will stop the conversation. It'll stop the story going forward. And here's a really interesting block. Yes, but. Yes, but. If you say yes, but to someone, the but part is negating the yes before it. It sounds like an acceptance, but it's actually a block. Hey, you want to go to the party tomorrow night? Yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of tired. That's a no. So say no. But pay attention to how people respond. Yes, but they're not going to receive your offer. Now here's another interesting thing about improv. There's one more kind of acceptance, and it is the partial acceptance of no but, right? Because the but negates the thing before it. Hey, you want to go to the party tomorrow night? No, but maybe I'll show up later. Hmm. Right? So now we've got a partial acceptance. So Jesus says to the woman, give me a drink. What does she say? How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? No, but why are you talking to me? <laughs> ah, a partial acceptance. So then Jesus does what? He responds to her by saying, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This is an improviser's move. He just said, yes, and. Yes, and is the whole key behind improv. If you hear improv people talk about it, they'll talk about having a yes, and spirit. Yes is accepting the offer, and is endowing, adding to the offer, adding something to it, building something slowly. Jesus said to her, 
yeah, I know you're a Samaritan woman, and if you knew who I was, you'd get something really cool. Huh. Guess what? Yes and is open, it's generative, it's cooperative, it's attentive. And from here on out, pretty much Jesus, I call it, he yes ands her into the kingdom of God. Here, I'll show you. All right, John 4, 11, so this is the next thing. So he says, if you, yeah, if you knew who I was, I'd give you living water. She then says, wait a second, sir, you don't have anything to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You're not greater than Jacob. Uh, no, are you, are, you are not greater than Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of himself and his sons and his cattle? Uh, yes, but, that's her response. <laughs> She's like, um, yeah, I hear that, but I, hmm, I don't think so. So he's got a block on this one, but at this point, he's already engaged in conversation. And what's the answer to a block? Yes, and. Yeah, I do think I am better than Jacob, by the way. He says that. <laughs> Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again, but uh, whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. See how great I am? What? So she responds at this, she wants it. He's finally got her to say her own yes and. Sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty and come here to drink. Ah, he's got her. Now we're having a yes and conversation, right? But here's where Jesus is the master. He creates a whole new offer. He says, go call your husband and come back here. Now this is an interesting offer for this woman. It's not really something she can say yes or no to. So she says, I have no husband. She says, I can't. It's kind of a no, but she's being honest. And this is the perfect yes and moment. Jesus says, yes, you're right. You have no husband, for you've had five, and the one who you have now is not your husband. This you've said truly. A beautiful yes and to the thing she's most ashamed of. She gives him a little bit and he takes it and adds more with no shame. In this moment, you think, great, if I'm gonna be having a conversation with someone who is not like me, how on earth am I gonna know that they have this secret hidden in their, like this is a jesus -y thing, right? Jesus, only Jesus could say that. Well, I'm gonna argue something. Jesus was able to do that because he was paying attention. He was paying attention to the woman and he was paying attention to the Spirit and the Father. You know, the Spirit knows things. Spirit knows things and wants to tell us things. The Spirit knows and wants to tell us um, many things um, about other people. Plus, you can also, if you're paying attention to a person, you can just figure things out about them that will shock them. Um, I have an example of this, if you're curious. Um, I met a guy who was a former movie studio executive who uh, had retired and was now going through the 12 steps. He was in recovery. And he was telling me about his image of God and um, kind of where he was in his recovery. And I looked at him and I said, I bet you're making art. And he was shocked, like, like the woman at the well, like, how did you know? How did you know I'm making art? Well, I know enough to know about the 12 steps that it's quite generative. I think a movie studio executive is an artist who's a little frustrated. And when you go through this experience, usually art is what comes out of it. But the Holy Spirit also said, hey, Monica, ask him if he makes art. Right? So it's a combination. Pay attention. Pay attention to the other person. Pay attention to God and the Holy Spirit. You never know what you might be able to say in conversation. I gotta tell you, paying attention is one of the most important things you can do right now in your life. I just read an article that said in the 21st century, the key to success will be knowing how to pay attention. Your attention is so important that companies are making money off of it and they want it. 
and they're trying to take it from you. But if you learn how to control your own attention and pay attention, you can change the world. Because what do we all most want? All of us, most in our hearts, we want someone to pay attention to us. And that's what Jesus did to the woman at the well. Okay? So, I'm going to jump to the end of the story. You can read the rest of it, and you can tell me as you read through it, now that you know about yes and, yes but, no. Like, pay attention and see if Jesus continues to yes and or into the kingdom. But this is how it ends. This conversation, but of the whole conversation, of all the things Jesus says to her, that moment where he was paying attention to her was the most important, and here's proof. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. The rest of the conversation was about where to worship and, and who's the prophet and all this. This moment where he said to her, yeah, I see you, that was the moment that was most important to her. That was the part that convinced her that he was the Christ because he paid attention to her. And they went out in the city and they came to see him. So, in review, if you want to have a conversation with somebody across the aisle, across the divide, someone who drives you crazy, number one, create safety for yourself. Find where you're safe. Don't do this in a place where you feel unsafe in any way, because if you do, you're going to attack, and they'll attack back. Find safety for yourself, and then find the safest place for the other person as well. I'm going to argue that social media is not a safe place to have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right? Don't have those conversations there. It's not safe. Everyone can see that. The best place to have a conversation is one-on-one, -on -one, eye to eye. Right? then make an offer. Strong, clear offers are best. Will you have coffee with me? What a great offer. That's strong and clear. That's better than, hey, you want to maybe uh, kind of get together sometime, maybe? That's not a strong offer. <laughs> not a strong offer. Make a nice, strong, clear offer. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, by the way, if you're ever, um, in real, real trouble, and you need somebody to call 911 on your behalf, point to a person and make them a strong offer. You call 911 for me. It, that's when it's going to happen. If you say, somebody call 911, it's not as strong an offer. <laughs> and no one will do it. So make a strong offer. By the way, one more thing about offers. Guess who doesn't make offers very strongly? Women. Men are taught to make strong offers. Women are not. Women, make strong offers. You've got strong offers in you. Try it. Start something. But remember that it's the other person's choice to accept or block, OK? Don't take offense if somebody blocks a strong offer. You're just presenting it. This is what love is, a presented gift. You present it to them. They get the choice to say yes or no. And pay attention to how they're saying yes or no. If you hear no but, you got yourself a little bit of a yes. Run with it. A quick parable about that. There were two sons. The father asked them to go into the vineyard. One of them said yes and didn't go. Yes, but. The other one said no and went. No, but. Right? Okay. And finally, when you've got a person engaged, when they've accepted your offer, say yes and. Accept and endow. Say yes to all their responses and their offers. Avoid your own blocking. Avoid saying yes, but. How many arguments do you get into with it's yes, but? Build something together. Say yes, and. Add something to what it is they say. When you say yes to someone, you're affirming their experience. Whether or not you agree with their point of view, maybe you think they're totally wrong, but you know what? Their experience is their experience, and you can say yes to that. You can say yes, and you can add to that. And finally, and most importantly, please pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention to God. Pay attention to the other person. If you're paying attention to someone, it kind of looks like love. 
it's been argued that some people uh, who get listened to think they're experiencing being loved because that's the closest thing we have. If you want to really love your neighbor and love your enemy, pay attention, listen, say yes, say yes and, see what happens. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.